on the 7th of August, 1941, in the city of Calcutta, a man died. His mortal remains perished, but he left behind him a heritage which no fire could consume. It is a heritage of words and music and poetry, of ideas and of ideals, and it has the power to move us, to inspire us, today and in the days to come. We, who owe him so much, salute his memory. Founded in the year 1690 by an Englishman named Job Charnock, Calcutta, 100 years ago, was a thriving metropolis. Queen Victoria was proclaimed Empress of India in 1877. As the capital of India, Calcutta was the seat of the Queen's government. part of the sprawling city, in the area known as Jorashanko in Chitpur, was the family residence of the Tagores. The Tagores had an impressive lineage. It dated back to the first group of learned Brahmins that came from Kanauj and settled in Bengal in the 8th century. One thousand years later, Panchanan, a descendant, came to the new city of Calcutta and found a lucrative position with a British shipping company. His grandson Nilmoni added to the family fortune and built the house at Jorashanko. The peak was reached with Nilmoni's grandson, one of the most brilliant and colorful figures of the 19th century. Dwarkana Tagore combined cultured sophistication with a largeness of heart and a rare degree of business acumen. Coal, sugar, indigo, exports, banking, newspaper. There was no end to his enterprises and he succeeded in all. If his earnings were fabulous, so were his spendings. <laughs> Although a Hindu and a Vaishnav, Dwarkanath defied the ban of Brahmin orthodoxy and twice went to England. There he had an audience with Queen Victoria, discussions with Gladstone, and dinner with men like Dickens, Thackeray and Max Muller.
Shortly before his death in England, Dwarkanath had written to his eldest son in Calcutta, reproving him for neglecting the family's business affairs. For some years past, young Dabendranath had been developing tendencies which might well have distressed his father. It began in a burning heart. The last rites were being administered to Dabendranath's grandmother. Not far away, on the river bank, sat Dabendranath. Like many a rich man's son, he had been leading a wayward life. But tonight, he was overcome by a strange feeling. Worldly possessions seemed to lose their meaning for him. This led to a period of profound disquiet, followed by a ceaseless quest for the meaning of existence in the great source books of the East and West. He read the materialist philosophers of modern Europe, Locke, Hume, Bentham and others, whose ideas were so much in vogue among the students of the time. Then he learned Sanskrit and read the Mahabharata. But peace of mind would not come until one day he chanced upon a torn page of a Sanskrit book. There was a sloka in it which said, God is supreme and all-pervading. Enjoy by renunciation. Covet not another's wealth. This was a page of the Ishopanishad, edited by Raja Ram Mohan Rai. Ram Mohan had been a close friend of Dwarkanath's. As a boy, Devendranath had a deep and silent admiration for the man. But the greatness of the Raja's vision and the magnitude and nobility of the tasks he had set before himself were beyond the boy's comprehension. Ram Mohan lived in times when India's spiritual heritage was being submerged in ritual and superstition. While in the West, a whole new concept of humanity was emerging. Ram Mohan advocated Western education for Indians because he wanted the new ideas of the West to spread in the country. He also wanted that we should respect what was old and true in our own heritage. In the Upanishads, for instance, which revealed to him the monotheistic basis of Hinduism. Ram Mohan's work was left unfinished by his death in England. But Devendranath, inspired by the two lines of Sanskrit text, went on to prove himself to be the Raja's true spiritual son and heir. Devendranath suffered social ostracism for preaching the monotheistic faith that he called Brahmoism, but to his followers, and there were many, he was Mahoshi, the great sage. When Rabindranath was born, the Mahoshi was 45 years old. His wife Sharada Muni was 33. Rabindranath was the 14th child. The eldest was Dijendranath, poet, philosopher, mathematician. Second son Shottendranath translated the Gita and Meghdut in Bengali verse and became the first Indian member of the Indian civil service. The fifth son, Jyotirindranath, was a born musician, translated Molière and Sanskrit dramas into Bengali, and wrote and staged some of the most popular Bengali plays of his time. Among the daughters was Shorna Kumari, the first woman novelist and the first woman to edit a journal in India. Indeed, it was a household which hummed with artistic activity. Oh, earth, what else? And shall I couple hell? Oh, fie, hold, hold my heart. And you, my sinews, grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee? For Roby, the time hadn't yet come to participate in the activities of the elders. Going out in the street was forbidden too. And this was indeed a pity, for nothing seemed more fascinating to the boy 
than the world outside. At the age of seven, Roby was sent to school. Yes, I can see a box. Yes, I Robbie went to four schools and hated them all. But to say that he lacked education would be wrong. For his third brother, Himindranath, saw to his studies at home. And it was all done by the clock. Devendranath went on a trip to North India and took the boy with him. The last stop on a long tour was the rest house on Bakrota, the highest hill in the hill station of Dalhousie in the Punjab. was told by his father to roam about on his own. He was also taught to rise before the sun. And to handle money and keep accounts. The days often ended with a boy singing devotional songs to his father. Robi was 13 when his first book of verse, Kobi Kahini, came out. When Robi was 16, Dijendranath brought out a literary magazine called Bharati, and Robi found an admirable platform for his literary activities. The essays included pieces on European poets like Dante and Petrarch, whose acquaintance Robi had made in Ahmedabad, in the library of his elder brother Shottendranath. Shottendranath's wife, Ganadanandini, 
who was staying in England with her two children, was a remarkable woman who had been persuaded by her husband to come out of orthodox seclusion. Roby set out for England in the summer of 1878 and joined Ganadanandini in Brighton. If the plan was to provide the boy with a proper education, it came to naught, for Roby returned without completing his course of studies at the London University. While in England, Rabindranath had become acquainted with Western music. Some of the tunes he had learned found their way into his enchanting opera, Valmiki Pratibha. There were other tunes, however, which came from classical Indian ragas, used for the first time in an operatic context. Valmiki Pratibha was staged in the Tagore residence with Rabindranath in the role of the bandit turned poet. The rest of the cast too was composed of members of the Tagore family, all gifted with varying degrees of talent for acting and music. Among those who saw and praised this performance was the greatest literary figure of the time, Bonkim Chandra Chatterjee. A year later, when Rabindranath's Shanda Shangeet was published, Bunkim Chandra personally congratulated the poet and acknowledged his preeminence among the rising writers of the day. Of all the members of Roby's family, two were closest to his mind and heart. They were Jyotirindranath and his wife. Kadumbari Devi was two years older than Roby. She was his best friend and severest critic. Roby lived with these two for a time in a house in Sudder Street in South Calcutta. One morning, a strange experience befell the poet. One day, while I stood watching at early dawn, the sun sending out its rays from behind the trees, I suddenly felt as if some ancient mist had in a moment lifted from my sight and the morning light on the face of the world revealed an inner radiance of joy. The poem I wrote on the first day of my surprise was named The Awakening of the Waterfall. At the age of 22, Rabindranath married Bhavatarini Devi. The old-fashioned name was later changed to Mrinalini. Two months before the wedding, Rabindranath had received a letter from his father in which he was asked to prepare himself to look after the family estates.
After a period of initial training in the estate's offices in Calcutta, Rabindranath found himself in the very heart of rural Bengal, in the region around the river Padma. With a worldly wisdom unusual in a poet, but characteristic of the Tagores, Rabindranath in later life set about in a practical way to improve the lot of the poor peasants of his estates, and his varied work in this field is on record. But his own gain from this intimate contact with the fundamental aspects of life and nature and the influence of this contact on his life and work are beyond measure. Living mostly in his boat and watching life through the window, a whole new world of sights and sounds and feelings opened up before him. of people and the moods of nature were inextricably interwoven. The people found room in a succession of great short stories and nature in an outpouring of exquisite songs and poems. Dominant was the mood of the rains, exultant and terrible. Ridae mandrila damaru guru guru Kudila kunjita bolo romanjita bona In 1901, Rabindranath was 40 years old. His already enormous output of poems and plays had been gathered in one big volume. It comprised 21 books and included Shonarthuri, his first masterpiece. The same year, 1901, marked an event of a somewhat different nature. In Bolpur, in the district of Birbhum in West Bengal, Rabindranath had acquired some property in 1862, one year after Rabindranath was born. The property was made over to a board of trustees, and the deed specified that the place was to be used for meditation on the supreme formless being. According to the Maharshi's wishes, a seat of prayer and a temple of worship had been built, and close to the temple, a residential house which was called Shantiniketan, the abode of peace. Rabindranath had been worrying about the education of his children and he decided to start an experimental educational institution in Shantiniketan. It was to be a school, but not like the schools that had been the nightmare of his own childhood. It was to be like the forest hermitages of classical India. But to bring it into being was not an easy task. For one thing, it cost money. Rabindranath was obliged to sell, among other things, the copyright of his books. 
His wife added her bit by selling her wedding ornaments. Two months after the school was opened, she was taken ill. Three months later, at the age of 29, she died. For Rabindranath, it was the beginning of a series of personal tragedies. Nine months after his wife's death, his second daughter Renuka passed away. The hardest blow of all came four years later. Youngest son Shomindro took after his father in many ways. He was only 13 when he fell a victim to cholera. It was in the midst of these bereavements that Rabindranath participated in one of the greatest political upheavals in the history of India. In December 1903 was published the decision of India's Governor General Lord Curzon to split up Bengal into two provinces. The idea was to create a separate province with a Muslim majority, which would induce a rift between the two main religious groups and avert the possible growth of a united front against the government. But in proposing the partition, Curzon merely fanned the flame of patriotism that had been smoldering in the minds of certain visionaries all through the period of the Renaissance in Bengal. These men now came to the fore and led the millions to rise in protest. The series of stirring patriotic songs which Rabindranath composed for the occasion were sung in procession in the streets of Calcutta, with the poet himself in the lead. On October 16, 1905, the partition became an accomplished fact. In a form of protest that only a poet could conceive, Rabindranath turned the Black Day into a mass festival of Rakhi Bandhan, the tying of the band of friendship. a character which was not possible to foresee in its early stages. While admitting the bravery and patriotism of those who killed or were killed in a reckless bid for freedom, Rabindranath could not condone terrorism. He stated his credo in clear terms. The path of violence was not for India. Good could come only out of constructive work carried out in a spirit of tolerance. He had himself followed up his retirement from the political scene by devoting himself to the work of rural welfare in his estates. And there were other activities too. He was teaching at school, editing journals, and engaging himself in every conceivable form of literary activity. That his own countrymen now regarded him as their leading man of letters was proved by his 50th birthday celebrations in Calcutta sponsored by the Bengal Academy of Letters and attended by thousands, it was a unique occasion and the first time that such an ovation had been given a literary man in India. But to the outside world, Rabindranath was still an unknown name. The object of Rabindranath's visit to England in 1912 was to study the educational methods of the West 
and also to acquaint the West with his own work at Shantiniketan. He happened to carry with him on this occasion a notebook containing his own English translations of some of his songs, mainly from Gitanjali. He showed these translations to the English painter William Rotenstein, who had met him on an earlier visit to India. Rotenstein was so impressed that he sent a copy of the translation to the well-known Irish poet Yeats. In introducing the poems to a gathering of English writers and intellectuals, Yeats said, I know of no man in my time who has done anything in the English language to equal these lyrics. Even as I read them in this literal prose translations, they are exquisite in style and thought. Gitanjali was published in England in the same year. There has rarely been another instance of a poet gaining world fame in like manner. The Nobel Prize came in 1913 and the knighthood in 1915 while war was raging in Europe. Touring the United States and Japan in 1916, Rabindranath made eloquent appeals for peace. He felt that world peace could only be achieved through intellectual cooperation between nations. He said, the call has come to every individual in the present age to prepare himself and his surroundings for the dawn of a new era, when man shall discover his soul in the spiritual unity of all human beings. Pursuing this noble idea of international cooperation, Rabindranath gave the school at Shantiniketan a new status and a new name, Yatra Vishwam Bhavati Ekaniram, where the world becomes a single nest. This was the motto of the Vishwabharati. It was inaugurated on the 24th of December 1918 with the aged philosopher Brajendranath Shil residing. Rabindranath made over the entire Nobel Prize money towards the building of this university. While peace had been restored in Europe, in India there was unrest. The Rowlatt Bill, designed to suppress all political movements, dashed India's hopes of gaining the self-government that the British rulers had kept promising through the war years. Dominating the Indian political scene at this time was Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, who, as a barrister in South Africa, had fought for the rights of the Indians living in that country. As a protest against the Rowlatt Act, Gandhi launched a movement of passive resistance. But the masses misinterpreted the movement, and following a rumor of Gandhi's arrest, violence broke out in many parts of the country. As a result of this, the government started taking repressive measures out of all proportion to the magnitude of the violence. Punjab, martial law was declared. In charge of the troops at Amritsar was Brigadier General Dyer. On the first day of the month of Vaishak, a crowd gathered in Jalian Wallabagh, as it had done every other year. It was a peaceful crowd, but Dyer was taking no chances. News of the Amritsar incident was suppressed by the government, but details filtered through to other parts of the country and even to the abode of peace. Rabindranath rushed to Calcutta. But the Defense of India Act was still in force and no leaders would support him in a plea for a meeting of protest. At four o'clock in the morning of May the 30th, Rabindranath finished writing a letter. It was addressed to the Viceroy. Condemning the government for the killing in the Punjab, Rabindranath ended by saying, 
and I, for my part, wish to stand, shorn of all special distinctions, by the side of my countrymen, who, for their so-called insignificance, are liable to suffer degradation not fit for human beings. And these are the reasons which have painfully compelled me to ask your excellency to relieve me of my title of knighthood. The next ten years of Rabindranath's life were filled with ceaseless activity. The urge to travel and the necessity to collect funds for his university took him to all parts of the world. And the West, as much as the East, welcomed him with open arms. spread the message of peace and stressed the importance of intellectual cooperation between nations. He said, we ought to know that isolation of life and culture is not a thing of which any nation can be proud. In the human world, giving is exchanging. It is not one-sided. He also said, I do not put my faith in any new institutions, but in the individuals all over the world who think clearly feel nobly and act rightly. They are the channels of moral truth. His great humanist ideas found an echo in the best minds of Europe, and some of them became his close friends. In the meanwhile, the institution at Shantaniketan had come a long way from its modest beginnings. Its scope for studies had greatly increased. There was Kalabhavan for the study of painting, under masters like Nandulal Bosch. Who was himself a pupil of Abhinindranath, the poet's nephew. The Shangit Bhavan, which neglected no branch of Indian music, had also grown under Dinendranath, another nephew of the poet. Special provisions were made for conducting oriental studies, and scholars came from all over the world, stayed to lecture, for research, to exchange ideas. Such men were Levy, Winternitz, Lesny, Stenkonov. And there were some Europeans who did even more than that. Charles Freer Andrews, a missionary who was present at Yeats' reading of Gitanjali, and William Winston Lee Pearson, who also met the poet in England, came to the ashram in its early days and stayed on until their death, working with a selfless devotion to the poet and his cause that few Indians could equal. Leonard Elmhurst was another Englishman whom Tagore had met in America. He was drawn by the poet's personality came over to Shantiniketan and took charge of the School of Rural Handicrafts, another of Rabindranath's experiments at Shurul, two miles from Shantiniketan. His last European tour began with a visit to Oxford, where he delivered the series of Hibbert lectures, which were later published as The Religion of Man. It was also on this last trip that Rabindranath went to Soviet Russia for the first time. On the eve of his departure from Moscow, he told his hosts, You have recognized the truth that in extirpating all social evils, one has to go to the root and the only way to it is through education. In Russia, as well as in other countries that he visited on this tour, Rabindranath held exhibitions of his paintings. 
At the age of 70, Rabindranath had found a new outlet for his creative urge. It was astonishing the way it started. In 1931, the leading citizens of Calcutta united in an appeal to observe the poet's 70th birthday. It was celebrated in a manner that was truly worthy of the occasion. The Golden Book of Tagore was a testimony to the love and reverence that the intellectuals of the world board for Rabindranath. Its sponsors consisted of three Europeans and two Indians. There was Romer Roland from France, Albert Einstein from Germany, the poet Costas Palamas from Greece. The Indians consisted of the scientist Jagadish Chandra Bosch, who had been the poet's closest friend for 40 years. The other Indian was Mahatma Gandhi. In physical appearance, in personal habits, and in general outlook, the two differed considerably. At several moments of crisis in India's political history, the two had disagreed over the course of action, but these were on the surface. Their deeper affinity transcended all occasional barriers. The last years of the poet's life were spent largely in his beloved Shantiniketan. He had a choice of small houses built for him, for he never liked to stay in the same house or even in the same room for long. It was, in a way, symbolic of the refusal to get into a rut which marked his whole life. In his writings, 
he was now producing some of his most striking, original and mature works. And these included textbooks and nonsense rhymes for children. Not an unusual occupation for someone who had loved and understood children so well and done so much to mold them for a better future. His health was failing, but calls of duty, which he was ever ready to answer, gave him little rest. On the 7th of May, 1941, Rabindranath was eight years old. Three months later, he was to leave Shantiniketan, never to return. <laughs> He would be taken to his ancestral house in Calcutta, fatally ill. In this house, once upon a time, a boy roamed the corridors. Rabindranath attended the 80th birthday celebrations in Shantiniketan in spite of his failing health. Today, for the occasion, he had composed a message 
his last message to the world. It was called the crisis in civilization. It concerned itself with the state of the so-called modern civilization, a civilization that was being shaken to its very roots by barbaric wars of aggression. of this message, Rabindranath said, I had at one time believed that the springs of civilization would issue out of the heart of Europe. But today, when I'm about to leave the world, that faith has deserted me. I look around and see the crumbling ruins of a proud civilization strewn like a vast heap of futility. And yet, I shall not commit the grievous sin of losing faith in man. I shall look forward to a new dawn, to a new chapter in history, when the Holocaust will end and the air will be rendered clean with the spirit of service and sacrifice. Perhaps the dawn will come from this horizon, from the east, where the sun rises. On that day, Will unvanquished man retrace his path of conquest, surmounting all barriers to win back his lost human heritage? <laughs> Ma